I love that we can see the wind or the, the wave action starting already. Um, so one quick note before we dive right into the presentation and a clip from Chasing Carbon Zero. Um, if you guys do have any questions, please drop those into the chat in Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook and YouTube, and we will get to those during the last 15 minutes or so of the presentation. So any questions, drop those in there and we'll get to them at the end if we have time. All right. And Habib, just let me know when you want me to start the video or if you have, if you want to start a demonstration prior to the video rolling. We're we'll go ahead, we're ready to roll the video right now. Okay, great, here we go. And this is a clip from Chasing Carbon Zero. Floating wind is a relatively new idea that opens up waters deeper than about 200 feet, which is the limit for turbines fixed to the bottom. This technology appears ripe for rapid growth. It's really a big physics experiment. What you try to do is try to get, get as much uh, valuable data as you can at a small scale. Is it 500 a year or it's maybe 50 a year? Habib Dagger is executive director of the University of Maine's Advanced Structures and Composites Center. He and his team are deploying a unique wind and wave simulator to test a scale model of a floating hull for wind turbines called Volturnus. We have load cells on the very top and bottom of the tower that tell us how much stress the tower is really seeing at that time. The base of the full-size version will be made of concrete. And inside some of the hulls are counterweights attached to springs and actuators. They are designed to negate the motion of the rolling sea. You want to make sure it doesn't move too much. So we're trying to minimize the motions at the turbine level. Uh, and we're trying to reduce the pitch of the hull so it doesn't pitch too much over. In 2013, they moored a floating 20 kilowatt, 1 8 scale model offshore for more than a year. It got hammered during the long main winter, but never tilted more than five degrees. Habib hopes to have a bigger 11 megawatt turbine floating in the next few years. So you want to make it lighter? You want to make it easier to build? Uh, so it's not just about designing something and making sure it works. You got to figure out how to build it, how to build it in an automated fashion. We built the lab to try to answer those questions. The allure of offshore floating wind is multifaceted. The turbines are built on shore, reducing construction cost and environmental impact. They can be towed to wherever the wind is more consistent, but the water too deep for fixed bottom installations. You can go 20 or 30 or 40 miles offshore. You can't do that with fixed bottom winds. You can put them in places where people can't see them. And you can design them to put them in places where you minimize the impact on the environment, the birds, the bats, uh, and, and the fisheries and the mammals. It gives you a lot more places to work with. Floating offshore turbines also make it possible to develop wind energy on the west coast of the U.S., where the waters are precipitously deeper. Within 50 miles of the U.S. coasts, both east and west coast, there's enough offshore wind capacity, theoretically, to power the country four times over. All right. Great clip. And we are now transitioning into a conference room where we're going to get more information from Habib. Great to have you back. Uh, we're in the conference room right now, and uh, we're going to go over floating turbines a bit more and, and uh, really happy to take your questions. So we're going to spend about 10 minutes talking about what we've been doing over the last 15 years to make uh, floating turbines a reality. But I'd like to get started by asking you to look very carefully at your screen and look in the water and see if you could see a school bus, just like the one you take home every day. Can you see the school bus? If not, I'm going to try to point at it uh, with a cursor. And I'm moving my cursor over. And, and this is where the school bus is. Can you see that? And, and, and you can 
tell the scale right now of these floating turbines. They're not tiny. Uh, and, um, and think about making these uh, dockside in a port facility somewhere and towing them out to sea uh, and, and mooring them to the seabed. What I'd like to do is show you where the mooring lines are. There's different kinds of ways to moor them, but uh, like a ship is moored with a, with a mooring line and anchor. These are ships again, but now we use typically three or six mooring lines depending on, on the loads that we have and the size of the turbine. Um, but you can see there are three mooring lines in each corner in this particular design. This design is called the semi-submersible. Uh, basically, it is the design is borrowed from the oil and gas industry uh, and, 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 and used in a wind turbine. Uh, the, um, the hull also has a cable coming out of it. It's an electric cable that, that will bring the power back to shore. Um, and the cable uh, makes a jog in the cable. We call it a lazy curve or S-curve. And, and you can see here where we have buoyancy modules. Uh, again, I'm going to go ahead with my cursor. And, and uh, there's the buoyancy modules that hold up the cable. We call it a dynamic cable because the unit, the, the floating hull, will move around as the waves and the winds come from different directions. Then it doesn't move a lot around. It moves some, but, but the cable has to follow it. And that's why we have a, a lazy S cable. We call it a dynamic cable. That cable is eventually fixed to the seabed. Uh, and, and then when you have a, a farm that might have 50 of these units, uh, you have cables coming from these different uh, floating turbines coming together to a collection point offshore, a substation offshore. And then from there, we'll have one cable going back to shore. Uh, that, so that's that's typically what the uh, unit looks like. A bit about our research center. Uh, this is our research center at the University of Maine, where the largest university-based research in Maine. And we hire students to come and work with us all over campus. Uh, we have 2,700 students from 35 majors who've worked on these projects the last 15 years. Let's get to leave the class and work in a team where they help design these terms them in the laboratory. Uh, and eventually, uh, the design will go offshore. So, so students are, are getting hands-on. They get paid to do it along the way. Students can work up to 30 hours during the academic years and the summer and the break. So graduate as an undergrad uh, from a program where you have a laboratory, you have more than a full-time experience going into industry. Uh, this, these are the partners and clients from across the globe that work with us on developing these technologies. So these, these companies are the companies we interact with as we develop new technology in offshore wind and other types of research that we do in the center. Many of our students end up interacting with these companies. Some of the students we've had have traveled to Europe and, and, and met some of these companies and worked with them. Um, back in 2020, uh, we put a strategic plan together for us, for the center, we call it GEM. And it stands for Green Energy and Materials. So our mission, is to bring green energy and materials to society, but not only developing the technology, but also educating the leaders who will take these technologies and implement them in society. Many of the students who've um, graduated from our program are now leaders in, in this industry, making it happen uh, throughout the country and the world. But let's go back a bit to the United States. If you look around the US, the areas uh, around both coasts are colored light blue and dark blue. The light blue areas are where the water depth is less than 150 feet. And this is where you can fix the turbines to the seabed. The dark blue areas are deep waters, deeper than 150 feet, and it's too deep to fix the bottom, a, a turbine to the seabed. It costs too much to do so. So, um, so the dark blue areas are where um, we need to use floating turbines, like, like you saw earlier. And, and that's about two thirds of the offshore wind resource in the US needs floating turbine technologies. And that's why the US government uh, this, this year declared floating wind as a US earth shot. It's called the wind shot. And what it means, it's a key technology that the country needs in order to meet its climate goals and its energy needs. So we're very pleased that this technology we've been working on for 15, 15 years is now a US earth shot. And how much offshore wind do we have to, do, are we planning to build around the United States? By 2030, the goal is to have 30 gigawatts of fixed bottom wind. And by 2035, to have 15 gigawatts 
of additional floating wind. So by 2035, we'll have 45 gigawatts of offshore wind in the country. Uh, and, and so we're, we're focused on working on floating wind. If you look at the West Coast, if you're in the West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington today, notice it's all dark blue. So the only option you got there is floating turbines. On the, in the Gulf of Maine in the Northeast, you see that's also dark blue. That's where you have to also use floating turbines versus fixed bottom turbine technologies. So how many designs of floating turbines there are? Every day I wake up, some, there's another new design that, that I, I learn about. There's over 100 designs today of floating turbines. You could see what they look like. Uh, and our design that we developed at the University of Maine is shown in the center. It's, it's semi-submersible designs. But if you take all these designs, they fall into essentially four families of designs. These are the four families. Uh, and, and, and all the other designs somehow come out from, from these families. One is called the tension leg platform on the left-hand side. That's, that's a, um, a unit that is like a buoy that wants to pop out of the water, but, but you have three tension legs that tie it down to the seabed. So if you cut the tension legs on the left drawing, it'll pop out of the water. And the second one to the right is called the barge design. And like a barge is, it's basically like a, like a ship or a barge that float on the, on the water surface. Um, and that's not a very stable design typically, but there's new technologies we're developing to allow it to become stable. Uh, the, the, the third one from the left is the semi-submersible design. And that's the one that we, we've I've showed you earlier that the University of Maine and others have developed. Uh, and then the one on the right-hand side is called the spar design. It's like a big floating tube with a mass at the bottom and, and the, the tube is full of air. And that's what keeps it vertically up and down. So if you take a, a Pepsi bottle, empty it out of Pepsi and put some sand at the bottom and put it in a bathtub, what happens to it? It's going to stand up, right? And if you push it over a little bit, it'll come back. And that's the spar design, but but it's, the spar design is much bigger than a Pepsi bottle. Uh, they're over; it's about a football field long under the water, and and um, about about twenty five or thirty feet in diameter. So these are very big structures we're talking about. Uh, so the challenge is how to design these, and and uh, in the lab at the University of Maine, we've developed a variety of uh, facilities to allow us to um, to test these designs and test the blades. How big are the blades these days? Very big. Some of these blades are today one and one third football field long. Think about one blade uh, is one and one third football field. So I'm going to try to run this video if uh, this will let me do it. Here we go. I want to show you here a blade that's being tested in our laboratory. This happens to be um, a 160 foot long blade, and we could we can fatigue the blade, bend it back and forth to simulate. Uh, storms that we'll see every day, as well as extreme storms, and and, and see if it's going to hold up. And th the goal is to develop next generation blade designs that will hold up uh, uh, to extreme storms. Uh, we've also you've seen our wave wind basin facility. That's the only facility of its kind in the United States, and it's a combination of a wave basin. There's a bunch of wave basins out in the country. There's wind tunnels in the country, but nobody's put the two together yet. And we're the first to do that. And you can see an open jet wind tunnel in the background uh, uh, that allows us to do this. And um, this is the turbine that we launched actually exactly 10 years ago. So 10 years ago on May 31st, 2013 is when we put the unit in the water. And, and uh, this was a one to eight scale version of the bigger unit. Notice it's not very small either. And we towed it out to sea. Uh, uh, about 10 hours to get to the final location. We towed it out with a tugboat. And this was designed and built by the students and the staff at the university. And it had over 50 sensors on board. So after we towed it out, uh, we, we placed it off Castine, Maine in 2013. And in June 2013, exactly 10 years ago, was, was the anniversary of offshore wind electron flowing into the US grid for the first time. So. Today is a 10-year anniversary, a very important day for all of us here in Maine, is that that's the very first time that offshore wind electron came onto the U.S. grid. And that was a research project that we built. You could see the unit in Castine, Maine. You see a lighthouse. That unit was a one to eight scale unit, and it had an undersea cable that brought the power back to shore. And, and I want to show you here uh, the very first uh, storm that we saw coming out of that. Um, and this... Uh, keyboard just stopped working. So let's see if it'll allow me to move again. Mm 
Okay, that's supposed to be a, uh, a video right now. Okay, this we'll try again one more time. Here we go. So um, this was December of 2013, so a decade ago almost, in December. And uh, that was the very first major storm that we saw on the floating turbine. This storm was a 50-year return period storm, meaning that relative to its size, the wave was roughly 60 feet high from peak to trough. And you could see the big, um, the size of the waves relative to the size of the hull, and you don't see the hull moving very much at all, and even though it is floating. And that was really what we're trying to prove out. And we had these sensors on board that showed us that our computer models really work. Uh, so that was a big aha moment for all of us that you can build floating turbines that will withstand 50 and 500 year storms uh, with the right engineering and designs. And what you see blown across, it's not fog. This actually is a snowstorm. So that's snow blown across on the hull. So where do we go from now? Where are we, where are we heading next? Uh, we are planning over the next two years, if you're um, interested to participate, you can come and work with us at the University of Maine, but we're planning next year to put another turbine in the water, a floating turbine, and that would be in 2024, in, uh, in September of 2024. And it's a, it's a new design. And then back in, in, then again in 2025, we're gonna put even a bigger turbine in the water. So every year over the next two years, we'll put a turbine, another turbine in the water. And in 2030, we are gonna start the construction of a research array, which will consist of 10 to 12 turbines. And then starting in 2032 and on, we, we expect uh, commercial scale floating wind farms on both the East and West Coast of the United States to start, to start coming uh, into fruition. Um, and one thing I'd like to tell you about as well is, and you'd be excited about, we're using our, the largest 3D printer in the world right now to help this industry move forward. And we, we're printing tooling to make wind blades using this printer. And we're also very interested eventually to print vessels that could be used to service this industry. And that used to be science fiction years ago, but now it is reality. So I'm gonna show you a little video of the very first vessel that we printed three years ago using this, um, this technology. So this is a, um, a 25 foot, 5,000 pound, a marine patrol vessel uh, that we printed in a little over a weekend. So we started printing uh, on September 19th at about 10 o'clock at night and finished, uh, that was a Thursday and finished on Sunday night at 10, 15 at night. And this, the whole boat was printed in one piece and we didn't stop one minute. And that was a demonstration of what's possible at the time. You can Google that and you could see the, uh, and see the videos later if you're interested in that. But we are in the process of putting a bigger printer together, even bigger than the one we have right now. And, and our goal here is next summer, uh, uh, a year from now, to uh, put on the water the first 3D printed 70 foot vessel in the world and put people on it in the Gulf of Maine. And uh, so if you do come to the University of Maine and work with us, you could potentially work on this project. Uh, so could we print offshore wind vessels? The offshore wind industry is going to need what we call crew transfer vessels. These are vessels that are 70 or 80 feet long that will basically take crews to maintain these, 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 these facilities. Can you imagine printing those vessels that will go out and service these floating farms? That's really what we're looking to do. But we're not only just printing vessels, we're also printing homes. And we just printed the first entirely bio-based home in the world that was printed with with wood waste, wood fiber, and wood resins, uh, and, 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 and bioresins, and um, that we, we call it Biohome 3D. But I'm gonna keep that, tease you with that. If you wanna come and see us at the University of Maine, we'll, we'll, we'll help you see, you get, you'll help you see Biohome 3D. And, uh, and, uh, and that's what it looks like outside our laboratory uh, right now. And if you like skiing, um, it went through its first main winter. That's what it looked like back, back in December. Uh, and it did extremely well going through its first winter. So with this in mind, we're happy to take your questions. Dr. Anthony Vicelli is with me right here. Dr. Vicelli is really in charge of all of what I've showed you. I just talk about it, but he does it. So he's, he's the engineer who's in charge of the entire team. And that floating turbine that was done in 2013 was his PhD thesis. Uh, so it became the most read PhD thesis uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, a, in, in a number of journals. Uh, but that was his thesis that, uh, and now he's leading up a team of 45 engineers 
uh, they are working on floating wind technologies, the biggest team of its kind in the United States. So, so with this in mind, uh, we're happy to take your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I didn't realize we were going to get also a presentation awesome. about the world's largest 3D printer. That's uh, <laughs> super cool. <laughs> I can't resist, um, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are doing amazing stuff. And yeah, really, really Thank interesting. Um, so we do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, but before we dive into your audience questions, I do have just a couple of questions um, for both of you just about kind of how you entered this field. I like how you're you're totally selling University of Maine. I, I kind of want to drop my job and go <laughs> go learn how to make 3D homes out of a giant 3D printer. Uh, sorry, Nova. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering what inspired you to to get into this line of work, and yeah, what was your path to get where you are today? And and yeah, what tools can students begin now that will help them if they want to take this avenue? Sure, I'm going to answer the first half of the question. And I'm going to give Dr. Anthony Viselli to answer the second half of the question. Um, we started working on, on floating wind because about 16 years ago, uh, we had a big crisis uh, uh, in the country and in Maine. Energy prices went up through the roof. The gasoline prices went up to $4 a gallon. Heating oil prices went up to $4 a gallon. And the average family in Maine couldn't figure out how to heat the homes uh, and, and drive their cars. It was too expensive. 20% of the family income was going to heat the home and drive the car. Uh, but of course, we had a big crisis, a climate crisis in the country. So we looked at different ways we can use our local energy resources uh, rather than buy oil and burn it. And uh, what we identified is that floating wind is the biggest opportunity we have. In the Gulf of Maine, we identified that there was 156 gigawatts of floating wind capacity within 50 miles. That's the equivalent of 156 nuclear power plants worth of wind just blowing across. While we're out there buying oil and, and burning it that we can't afford and we're sending our money away and, and polluting the environment along with it. So we started the program of trying to figure out how to float wind turbines. At the time, uh, frankly, people questioned our sanity. Floating wind turbines, putting them beyond the horizon? Is it really feasible? Well, today, 15 years later, or 16 years later, it is an earth shot. It's, a, it's been declared by the federal government as one of the key earth shots and key technologies. And there's an international race to go there. So we're pleased that we were the first to do this in the US 15 or 16 years later, working with the National Renewable Energy Lab and some other partners as well. But in terms of what is it gonna take to get there? Um, uh, how could you be trained to work in this, in this environment? I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Vasali here. Great, thank you. And nice to speak with you all. Um, I think uh, in terms of training, I think there's, there's a really... No, no. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, maybe hold it a little closer. Great. Is that better? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> okay. There we go. It's probably picking... We're going gonna to be so close okay. to you right now. So. <laughs> I think it's picking up his mic. Um, <laughs> right now, to, to do these exciting projects that you need to see a teaser about today, um, we, we have a, a, a very large team of students, everything from undergraduate up to PhD. And they get, as Habib said, paid to work on these projects. So, And they're a critical part of our team. We cannot do these projects without the students. So the students, it's a two-way street. The students get a training and experience and exposure to to uh, companies and, 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 tr and training and specialty skill sets. And salaries. <laughs> and salaries. And, uh, and then for the project, um, of course, they're, they're actually doing real engineering and they're doing real drawings and they're running real tests and they're building real prototypes. Um, so it's, it's a, a very ex exciting way to get involved is by actually participating in the research um, and, 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 and coming to a hub like this one. Um, where, where you could you could be a, a, an integral part and then gradually as you gain more experience, gain more responsibility and exposure and take on more and more. And I can say that because I've lived that, I've done that myself. Um, it's It's been a great uh, journey. So I would, I would strongly recommend it to anyone who's passionate about doing uh, exciting engineering work and solving some of our largest challenges that we as a species have. Thank Amazing. you, Anthony. I may add, there's, there's certainly um, opportunities, not only to learn at the University of Maine, where there's opportunities across the globe as well. There's good universities in Europe that do this kind of work on offshore wind. Uh, but of course, uh, we're a little bit biased here. So, 
Awesome. I loved uh, when you showed us all the different kind of prototypes or different um, examples of potential floating wind turbines. Do you, are you guys still in the process of determining, will there be like one turbine that is the turbine, do you think, or will there be different utility for each of these different designs? Yeah, so uh, there's essentially a big international competition to, to, to develop these technologies that, are, uh, that can be less expensive, easier to deploy, and so on and so forth. So, so there's a competition internationally. So it's a free for all, if you wish. Anybody who has ideas, putting them on the table. And I tell everybody, there's always a better idea. You just have to find it. And, and so, so from your perspective as students and, 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 and that want to enter this field, there's a plenty of opportunity to, to make it even better. Um, uh, and there's going to be a number of designs out there. I don't think there's going to be one design that's going to win it all because there's so much need out there. Um, uh, when, you, when you say um, uh, uh, in the United States alone, there's going to be um, 30 to 40,000 jobs just on the East Coast looking at floating, uh, uh, looking at offshore wind. So there's a lot of needs, a lot of opportunities, a lot of designs are going to be out there. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a fertile uh, uh, field to get into. So. I would just add that it's also regional. Um, uh, depending on where you are in the world, certain designs uh, make more sense based on uh, locally available infrastructure, the available ports, the available materials and labor forces. So you, you may see regional designs, just like as you travel around the country, you see differences in infrastructure. The bridges look different as they do, as they do in Maine, as they do in California. Um, they, and so you're going to see regional differences, I think. And then also there's technology, um, as, as Habib said, it's a very large market. So there, there, there's a very big uh, pie to share. So you're going to see a lot of technologies playing the space, just like in the tech sectors where you have um, about half a dozen different uh, phone companies that are all able to compete and, and work for, for different reasons, have different advantages. So I think there's th those two things what you'll see um, uh, a short list. I think we'll go down from 100. I don't think we'll stay at 100 designs for long, but maybe we'll get down to the six or so at the end of the day. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we have a ton of questions from our audience, so I think we'll transition to audience questions. You guys are so curious. I love to see all these questions pouring in. Um, if you haven't posted your question yet, there is still time. Drop it into our Zoom yeah, chat or Q&A session. Um, and also, if you're on joining us via YouTube or Facebook, you can uh, drop your questions in the comment section there. So let's get to some of these questions. Um, we've got a question from uh, someone named Jim. Um, he asks, how much electricity does one floating turbine generate? And is this electricity fed to a battery or is it supplied to users directly? How is the floating turbine anchored? Okay, so that's like a three-part question, but all great questions, Jim. I'm not hearing you guys. Can you hear can, me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We're doing good. So <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to answer your question. I'm gonna go back to the very first slide. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So each turbine has a cable that comes out of it that brings the power back to shore. But if you have lots of turbines, you don't bring a cable to shore from every turbine. What you do is if you have 100 turbines in one place, you bring all the cables to one point offshore, could be 30 miles offshore, that's called the substation. And then from that substation, you have essentially an export cable that could run 30 miles to the, to the farm um, and, and brings the power back to shore. So where is that power fed to? It depends on where you are, what you're doing with it. Typically, it'll go into the grid just like any other energy goes into the grid, whether it's a land-based farm or, or solar farm, that energy will go into the grid. Can you store it? Of course, in some places, uh, grids have uh, storage battery, ba battery storage capabilities or other storage capabilities uh, that, where you can actually store some of that energy. So, But that depends on where you are and, and, and what the grid looks like at that location. So. Okay. Great. Yeah, we had a lot of questions about that. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, not at all, not at all. I was just gonna answer the other two parts, which is uh, how many homes does one turbine power? Um, for the commercial scale units that are being proposed, they might be in 15 megawatt range okay. um, yeah. uh, per turbine. So you're looking at uh, over several thousand homes, each one could be powered and each farm would be about a gigawatt. Um, and a gigawatt is roughly about a nuclear power plant utility scale. Um, 
facility. So to give you a sense of, of, of the types of uh, farms that are being planned. I might add to that, just a gigawatt farm, as Anthony said, is it 1000 megawatts? And, and that would roughly uh, produce enough energy for 500,000 US homes uh, and, and maybe six to 700,000 European homes because they're a lot more efficient than we are in using their energy, so. so. Awesome, and, uh, thank you. The last question was how we anchor it. Um, as you can see here, you would have uh, three or more lines um, uh, draping. You can see them, they're, they're pointed through here. Um, they would connect the hull uh, down to the seabed where you would have a, uh, an, a typically a drag embedment anchor. It looks like a, a boat anchor um, where it plows into the seabed and it keeps it on station there for 25 years uh, for the life of the, of the project. So that would be uh, the, the goal. Um, each, each one of these floating foundations have three or more lines. It could be made out of uh, large ropes and chains connected to a, a drag plate anchor into the seabed. So think of it almost like mooring a ship. When you moor, when you when a big ship arrives, the Queen Elizabeth arrives somewhere. You drop anchor, right? And, and that's basically a big chain and an anchor at the bottom. Well, uh, take take three of these, and that's what we do typically to to, to moor one of these units. So we drop anchor essentially, but that the anchor stays dropped twenty five years. Okay, it keeps it on station. Yeah, does that Great. answer your question? Okay. I I think so. Yes, thank you. Um, let's see here. Whoops. Just so many of these questions. Um, we've got one question. Ooh, Joanna asks, what is the biggest concern with this technology? Um, there are, um, I tell you, there's a lot of concerns and, 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 uh, the, the biggest concern is, is, um, in order for us to deploy this technology, uh, we need shipyards. Uh, we call them port facilities, able to actually make them and deploy them. And these shipyards could be uh, between 75 and 150 acres in size that we can produce these hulls at, at uh, one every week or two weeks. Um, right now, we don't have the port facilities in the United States to do that. It's like trying to build ships without shipyards. Uh, so there's a big need in the country right now to invest in our port facilities uh, to be able to actually do this and implement this technology. But that's true not only in the United States, but throughout the world. Uh, so there's a, a race to build port facilities right now to do that. And these port facilities aren't cheap. So there's an, it's important that in Washington, there's an investment made in building these port facilities. So that's from a technical perspective, uh, one of the big uh, challenges we have moving forward. Uh, there's also transmission challenges. So uh, uh, bringing the power back to shore, where do you plug in? So you need substations on land to do that. And, um, and if we build a lot of farms and each one tries to plug in by itself, it costs too much money. Uh, it's important for us to be able to build an offshore grid uh, that will basically tie a lot of farms together regionally and then bring very few power cables back to shore. That's an important piece as well, which is a transmission and distribution. The other piece is really um, is how this, these units interact with their environment. Uh, and so how, the impact of these units on, on the birds, on the bats, mm -hmm. uh, on, the, uh, on the fishing industries that live around that, uh, on the whales and so on and so forth. So we're studying those very, very carefully to make sure that we don't make any mistakes along those lines. We, we also have to live with the, the, and work with the fishing industry that, uh, that makes a living on the ocean as well. So all of those are important considerations and we work very hard uh, to ensure that our environmental ecological aspects of the projects are well studied before we build farms and making sure that by working with the fishing industry, uh, everybody wins at the end. Great. Yeah, I imagine that's a ton of work. And I imagine you have to work with so many different groups from the biologists to the fishermen to the politicians, as you mentioned in your presentation. That's a lot of work for a lot of different people to make that happen. Exactly. And that's where a lot of the jobs in the industry is going to come in, right? You're going to have not only engineers, you're going to have also scientists, whether it's biologists, bird biologists, or fish biologists, or, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. So, Nice. Yeah, I imagine it's difficult to decide. The, I think maybe part of the thing that's so appealing about floating wind is you can kind of put it anywhere within that, you know, within that dark blue area that you showed us on the map so you can strategically place it. But I'm sure it's very difficult to determine where is the most strategic and advantageous spot to put a wind farm. 
Absolutely. And there's so many considerations for, for actually locating a wind farm. And there's a big process, both at the federal level, through the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, to identify sites for, for, for this and do studies before you can actually lease a farm to, to a developer. So it's a very big process uh, to do that. It takes, from the time you, you decide you want to do something to the time you have a farm, you're looking at five to seven years. So it's a very, very long process, eventually, to, to be able to dot the I's and cross the T's on the environmental impacts and get the permits that you need to put in there and so forth, so. That makes sense. Um, so Jean asks, do you see uh, much hope to harness wave energy in the next 10 years? I don't know if that is your wheelhouse. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Vicelli who works on that as well. So. Oh, great. Yes, there's um, a lot of interest globally in wave energy technologies. And for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with them, um, these are essentially, uh, you can think of them like a barge that's moored off offshore, just like the wind turbine. But instead of extracting power from the wind, as the barge moves up and down, it's actually extracting the energy of the, of the motion of the barge and, and sending that back to shore. So there is actually a race uh, similar, similar to floating wind. There's a race for wave energy to, to develop low cost uh, economical designs. Uh, the US Department of Energy has, has funded a number of competitions uh, called the Wave Energy Prize. Um, to, to actually try and incentivize and, and, and fund the R&D of these technologies. Um, the, the best place for wave energy, though, if you look on our map that's on the screen, is on the West Coast. That's really where the wave energy power um, is highest. Um, so that's where you would see that if it, as those, those designs become economical. That's where they would really take off. On the East Coast, we don't have as much uh, wave power because the wind predominant wind direction, which is what creates waves, is heading from the west to the east. So we, we have uh, fairly low waves relative from a wave power standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, the university, has, we've been testing wave energy devices in our tank. When we're not testing wind turbines, actually, we're usually testing wave devices. And uh, we've tested about 20 different designs from, from commercial companies around the, uh, the globe have come to our facility to use our tank. Because it, in addition to being a, a wind wave basin, it also is one of the deepest tanks in the country. Um, we're, we're about five meters of depth water depth, which is is, is unique, actually, facility. Um, so we, we're doing a lot of work in that space, and, and we're supporting those efforts from an engineering and testing standpoint. Although we're not a technology developer in that space, we're, we're, we are providing engineering and testing services um, in, that, in that field. Great. And could you guys possibly stop screen sharing so we can see your faces a little better? Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. But the screen sharing is great when you have to illustrate a point. Totally get that. Um, we've got a couple of questions from, from different students here asking about um, what classes are the best classes to take in high school or what is the best major to choose in college if you want to get into this field of study? Um, let me tell you, there's, um, there's so many opportunities in this field uh, across a variety of disciplines, uh, but, but certainly the STEM um, disciplines are important. Um, uh, so the, the science classes are important to you, whether you call it biology or chemistry, if you're interested in, in that aspect of it, and, uh, um, and ecology are important. Uh, otherwise, um, math and science are all very important in this, in this aspect as well, unless you want to be a policymaker and go make things happen uh, in Washington, D.C. and other places. There's opportunities as well, too. Uh, and we can't do it alone. I think we need to really work on the policy side as, as, as much as we work on the engineering and technology and science side. So, um, so classes, take your, take your math, take your physics, take your science classes uh, are all important in this field. And you can choose afterwards which direction you want to go. But also take, take the history classes and the, and the, and the social, uh, uh, social classes and so on and so forth. Because essentially, we have to all work together. And, and uh, we need sociologists that really understand uh, uh, how people behave and whether they want to farm or they don't want to farm. Uh, so communication is important as well. A lot of this is communication work. Uh, there's a lot of uh, leaders in this industry who are really communication leaders uh, that go out there and work with communities as well and get the word out there and so forth. So communication is important as well. Um, so, uh, so all kinds of opportunities. There's not, not one course that's not important to you, in essence, if you, uh, if you want to enter this industry. And when you go to college, of course, um, uh, it's the same thing. So you, you can go in a lot of different directions. If you want to be an engineer designing these, 
You can be a, a mechanical engineer is really probably the most relevant field. You can be a civil structural engineer. You can be an ocean engineer uh, uh, as well to work on these on these systems. That's the technical side. Electrical engineers, of course, work on the power side of this. Very important. Uh, if you're looking at materials, chemical engineers and durability of materials is important. So there's just about any of the engineering fields, but also the the, um, the computational fields. Modeling and computation is important as well in this. So uh, taking courses in computing is really important as well in this in this space. Uh, but again, if you get away from the science fields, you can go back and and, and enter, um, uh, as we said earlier, the policy side or the, so, the, the sociology aspects of it as well. So there's all kinds of opportunities for you in this space. It's really an industry is being born in this, in this country right now across the world. And, and it's going to require people across all disciplines to participate in it. Um, so, Anthony, you want to add to that? Yeah. I, I think that's one thing that excites me so much about this field is that we, we get to work with every discipline. Um, uh, as we've said, business, the uh, marine sciences, the policymakers, uh, and, and everything in between, lawyers, and, and uh, so everyone, really, it's an industry, and it takes all folks to develop projects like this. Uh, the only other engineering discipline I would, I would say, just to add to the long list to be mentioned is naval architecture is a really big uh, uh, discipline that's needed for these, as well as on the, the mariner side, there's a uh, um, maritime schools um, funding the pilots and captains and so forth that will actually um, deploy these units and install them as well as service them. They, there's a yeah. whole need on the deployment and operations side. So those those maritime fields uh, will be directly uh, rel uh, relevant as well. So very, very diverse um, set of skills. So I think there's something for everyone in short. Exactly. And I must say, these are the kind of jobs that chat GPT is not going to take away from us. Okay. <laughs> you still need important. people to build these things, get them out there and design. Them, right? so. Good point. Good point. Great. Um, so Johanna is asking um, what type of waste might be produced by this technology, if, if any. Yeah, certainly, uh, if you look at the operations of the turbine itself, um, uh, we look, we, we try to, that's the tower and the turbine itself. We try to, we are trying to work on materials that are 100% recyclable. Um, for example, right now, the blades, the old generation of blades were not easily recyclable. Uh, there are technologies being developed now to, to develop what we call thermoplastic blades. They're 100% recyclable. Uh, there are new technologies coming out where you can take the resins from these blades as well and, and then change their chemistry and recover the chemistry and, and use develop it for new resin systems. So there's a lot of research going on right now to try to recycle as many of these parts as possible. The, the, the tower sometimes is made out of steel and steel is recyclable as well, um, um, so, and so forth. The hull we're making out of concrete right now, we're trying to look at greener concretes right now for these hulls. And, and rather than give them 20 or 30 years of life, we're looking at giving them 100 years of life so that you can repower these hulls every every 30 years or so. So you reduce the carbon footprint and the cost at the same time. So so all kinds of uh, ideas and technologies are needed. And there's all, there's a, it's a fertile research effort right now to develop technologies that can be recycled that are greener. And that's a big part of what we do. Yeah, I would just just add many of the commercial um, uh, auctions that are taking place around the globe have requirements for uh, the carbon footprint and and demonstrate that you have certain amount of recyclable content um, that your carbon footprint is of a certain level. Um, so these are actually requirements for for a successful bid is to meet those requirements. So still thinking very seriously, how do we deal with waste? How do we deal with the the, the, the carbon footprint of these of these systems? Um, so that's already happening at a commercial level that um, to address those concerns. Yeah. And that's done at the policy level, really, um, by the governments who, are, who have control of the seabed rights. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, I do have one final question. Um, how can our, um, our guests, our, our viewers, stay in touch with you guys and continue following progress on all of these exciting projects? Um, Absolutely. So our website is a good place to go to. It's uh, composites.main.edu. Uh, 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 Taylor Ward here is uh, will be watching for your questions and, and uh, can connect you with us. Um, uh, there's all kinds of things also that Taylor is working on. We, we have actually a competition in Maine called the Windstorm Competition, where high school students and middle school school students can actually build wind turbines and come and test them in our lab at the end of the year and, and they get they, they win prices and and uh, we 
just uh, this last, um, uh, about a month ago, we had uh, about 800 people here, uh, 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 600 uh, students and, and 100 teachers that came and, and uh, they worked for months to design the turbines and brought them into our lab and we tested them and students presented the results and, and, uh, and the winning students got a scholarship, $20,000 scholarship to come and work with us in our laboratory. So, but, uh, but you can stay in touch with a competition like that. If you'd like to participate in such a competition, we can also work with you. So be even before you graduate from, from, from school uh, to come and, and, and work on this competition. So, so again, it's composites, C-O-M-P-O-S-I-T-E-S, composites.main.edu. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, Taylor Ward is putting her email in the chat as well. And, and uh, just send e an email to Taylor and, and as well, but um, yeah. yeah. Great, thank you so much. I think based on so many of these comments, I think you've probably created some future engineers in this session alone. There's so much interest and so much excitement in this field. So thank you so much for sharing with us. So I guess it's time to close it out. Um, thank you again so much to thank Dr. You. Habib Dogger and thank you so much Anthony as well for jumping on and for Taylor and all the other folks behind the scenes from the University of Maine. Uh, thank you for bringing this all together. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like, like to thank uh, everyone who's watching today from class or from home. Um, thank you so much for all your great questions. Um, without you, this conversation would not be possible. So thank you so much. We'll also be sending out a, a quick feedback survey after this. If you guys could take a minute to fill that out, it would help us create more awesome events like this in the future. Um, many thanks to our funders for NOVA, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the NOVA Science Trust, and PBS viewers. Additional funding for Chasing Carbon Zero was provided or was provided by the NOVA Science Trust with support from Anna and Neil Rasmussen and Howard and Eleanor Morgan, as well as the Alfred Vining Davis Foundations. If you're interested in seeing Habib on TV on NOVA, definitely check out Chasing Carbon Zero. You can find that on NOVA's website or on the PBS app um, streaming for free. Definitely check that out. Um, so both Chasing Carbon Zero and Weathering the Future, um, both of our climate change films that premiered in April, um, as well as this virtual field trip are part of NOVA's Climate Across America initiative. And you can follow us uh, and join the conversation on social media using hashtag Climate Across America. And definitely give us a follow on Nova Education for more virtual field trip content. Our next virtual field trip will be about illusion and neuroscience, and it will take place on Friday, June 16th. So definitely tune in for that. And thank you everyone so much. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, Habib. Thank you, Anthony.